You're listening to the Hayek Program podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Hello, my name is Jamie Lemke. I'm a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. My guest for this conversation is Dr. John Metacroft, a reader, which we might think of as an associate professor in the United States, in public policy in the Department of Political Economy at King's College London. John has researched extensively about political activism, political organization, and public choice and constitutional political economy in general. He has a particular interest in the work of James Buchanan. We talk about how he came to be interested in Buchanan's work and discuss at length the idea of a political economy of equals. So one of the controversial or challenging aspects of Buchanan's research program in constitutional political economy is that it was motivated at least in part by the uniqueness of the American founding as a great experiment in self-rule. And it certainly was a remarkable era in human history. However, the founding era was also a time of significant inequalities in how rights and laws applied to people of different races, genders, and backgrounds. So what can we learn about a liberal democracy by studying people who tolerated such a degree of illiberalism within their own society? An important idea John deals with in his research is the idea of moral equality and what it means to interact with each other from a position of moral equality. We also talk about consensual politics and what's distinct about a political system that's built on consent. How does collective action change when we talk about people voluntarily signing on to informed mutual political agreements rather than exercising power over each other? Those two ideas, consent and power over, are such contrasting paradigms that the way we think about politics and the way we think about democracy just has to be so different depending on which perspective we're taking. We also talk about some of the challenges that these ideas present for political theory and policy analysis. Because when power over others is problematic, so is being the expert who thinks they know what other people would agree to and what other people would want politically, rather than letting individuals actually take the initiative and be involved in the action of forming those agreements for themselves. We also discuss a really difficult problem that many constitutional theorists have struggled with, which is how do you get meaningful institutional change when the current institutions are unjust and the institutional gatekeepers are the beneficiaries of those unjust institutions? So chattel slavery is probably the most extreme and obvious example of such an injustice. And I really doubt that we'll ever get fully satisfying answers about how such a horrific scheme came to be and how it can be avoided in the future. Um, Human society carries with it this risk of danger and violence that we kind of constantly have to be on guard against. Um, it's a, it's, it's a bleak, at least it sounds like it could be a bleak picture. Um, but John and I do talk about some ideas in the constitutional project that might bring hope for the possibility of being able to ensure a more just, a more humanitarian future that does not contain room for such illiberalism and such violence. Um, so with that, I invite you to listen, and I think you will really enjoy and learn a lot from Dr. John Meadowcroft. Welcome. 
Welcome, John. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so one of the reasons why I wanted to, to talk to you with respect to this conversation we're currently having through the Hike Program podcast is that you've done some work that critically interrogates constitutional political economy, especially James Buchanan's work uh, from the perspective of what position it takes on the nature of equality and how that project also fits into the, the broader liberal project. So I thought before we got into the details of that, it might be nice just to hear how you originally got into studying the work of James Buchanan. Um, how did how did his work come to you or, or why did you wind up deciding going in that direction? Yes, yeah, so I've, I've been studying Buchanan for what seems like a very long time. And I think I first became interested in his work when I was teaching politics and public policy to undergraduates uh, probably about 20 years ago. And one of the big questions teaching politics is whether government policies reflect what people want. And to my surprise, sort of looking at those sort of questions with students, I found there wasn't a big literature dealing with that sort of question. And one of the works that I did found was Buchanan's article, Individual Choice in Voting in the Market, back from 1954. And I was really blown away that it's such a simple paper in lots of ways, but it gives a great answer as to why you know, we shouldn't expect public policies to really reflect what people want very often. There's, there's lots of reasons, you know, systematic reasons why policies won't reflect individual preferences. So to give one example, say that Buchanan talks about in that paper, just when you go to vote in an election, you're going to vote for a bundle of policies. So every party offers a whole range of policies and you have to choose between two bundles. And the chances of, of any individual agreeing with all the policies in each bundle is really quite small. So almost by definition, people are going to end up voting for policies that they don't actually agree with. And hence, policy outcomes are not going to reflect those people's preferences. So I, I just thought that paper was really just a brilliant paper. And that led me to look more and more at Buchanan's work. And I had a sense then of an overarching perspective that there was something big going on here from which this was a part. And I just wanted to get my head around this, this, this big thing that he created. And, that led me to write a book about his work as a way to, to learn about his work. And that that sort of set the ball rolling, I guess. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's such a great article because he almost gives you a list <laughs> of reasons to start thinking about why choice might wind up working up, out differently in <laughs> politics than in markets or you know other domains where we're not dealing with collective choice mechanisms. There may be some things he would have added to that article by the end of his career, but it's such a, a lovely accessible starting point. So I, yeah, I just, I just wanted to highlight that as a great recommendation for anybody who's listening, who doesn't know a lot about Buchanan yet. It's just a really good place to start. Yeah. For me, that, that would be a perfect starting point to find out about yeah, Buchanan's work of public choice more generally. I mean, yeah. if you like, that, that's the research program there is to, yeah, to expand on this, as you say, to add new points, to think about what goes on inside some of those points and so on. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a great starting point for Buchanan's work. And I think I chanced upon it really. It, it was luck that 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 came to me first, I think. Yeah, it, we probably it's difficult to easily categorize things as either public choice or constitutional political economy. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you found maybe the public choice first and then wound up moving from there into the constitutional aspect of the program, which which is a little different. Yeah, that's right. I mean, public choice obviously, I think is applying economic principles to politics. And that's what the article does clearly. Yeah, and constitutional political economy, I guess is thinking about the overarching rules of the game, how they then determine the outcomes. And that will be something different, although obviously the rules of the game determine the, the politics and so on that, that, that comes out of it. But yeah, I think there, there are sort of two distinct but, but linked projects, I think. Yeah. And so were you interested in liberalism before you started? reading Buchanan? I think I was. So I, I think for a long time I've considered myself uh, to be a, uh, a uh, liberal, whatever that might mean, I suppose. But I think I was looking for a sort of liberalism that suited me or liberalism that I thought reflected my, my values and my views. 
And I think, I mean, it's very hard to, to I think I've, I've come to the view that one should try and be a sort of take a pick and mix approach to some extent. I don't think you should subscribe to a thinker, you know, lock, stock and barrel, if you like. But but I think lots of Buchanan's works really, ideas really resonate with, with my own ideas. So, so yeah, I think I found in Buchanan's work, probably also in Nozick and Hayek, a liberalism that I thought, yeah, I felt comfortable with and that reflected my, my, my views. Can you articulate a little bit more exactly what that view is? You know, because, um, you know, you're coming into constitutional political economy from, from a different discipline. As you mentioned, liberalism could mean a lot of different things. It's a very big tent ideology, maybe. How, how would you define it? How do you define it in your work? Yeah, well, I think it should be a, a broad church. And I do think liberalism is a, a big enterprise, if you like. I, I don't personally try to be too exclusive about who is and who isn't a liberal, if you like. But I think, and this is why it always resonated with me, the, the core of liberalism is, is the, the uh, individual. So at the centre of liberalism, I think, is the idea the individual is the, the key component, if you like. So we understand society as made up of individuals. And the individual becomes, I think, is prior to the, to the whole, to the social whole, if you like. So, you know, as Buchanan himself wrote, you know, only individuals think, only individuals act. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a basic, you know, a basic fact, if you like, a basic methodological principle. And the second component then would be ethical individualism. So the idea that there's moral value attached to those individuals and each individual has their own sort of, you know, ethical inherent importance as an individual. I, th I think one of, I mean, one of the great statements of that, I think, is actually Nozick's Anarchist State and Utopia. When Nozick writes about the notion of trade-offs between different people's values or different people even, and Nozick says, you know, when you trade off one individual's values against another individual's, all you do is harm one person and benefit another person. Nothing else happens. There's no social whole that changes. Just one person gets harmed and somebody else benefits. And I think that's absolutely true. And therefore, if we're going to sort of impose costs on people, harm them, we need to be really careful that, that, about what we're doing and the, the, the way that's justified and how the calculus is made and so on. Because ultimately, yeah, each individual is, is, is what matters and then each individual is what's important. Yeah, one of the thing I appreciate one of the things I appreciate about the way Buchanan writes about that is that he distinguishes between individualism as a method in the social sciences, so using the individual as a unit of analysis mm -hmm. and a commitment to normative individualism, so that kind of idea that you were describing of the individual being the actor, the individual carrying moral weight. And then, you know, and Buchanan, of course, really emphasizes the individual as the locus of value and our inability to aggregate values across individuals um, in any kind of logically consistent way outside of the process of choice, allowing people to make their own decisions and kind of negotiate with each other. So I've, I've always appreciated that he distinguishes individualism can be a scientific method or it can be a normative commitment. And my work does both. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Buchanan, yeah, he's, that's right. That separation is very clear in his work, isn't it? And it's very, I think it's powerful to make that separation. Um, I think for Buchanan, you, you must have both in a sense. You, I don't think you could be a methodical individualist and not be an ethical individualist, but they are distinct things nevertheless. I think that's, that's definitely right. The other thing that's really striking when, especially if you come to Buchanan having not read um, other liberal thinkers of, this, of a similar perspective, is just how uncompromising he is in his individualism. I mean, for Buchanan, the only source of value is individuals' values. There's no meta values. It's just what individuals want, and that's that's the only source of value. And that's, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's pretty hardcore on, on that principle. Um, and that takes him to some inter interesting places, I think. But the the definite place is where he wanted to go, I guess. Yeah, and that position shapes a lot of the work he winds up doing in the constitutional sphere, uh, which kind of segues us nicely into this conversation. Um, I, I, obviously, you've written extensively on Buchanan, but you know one piece that really captured my attention for its relevance to this conversation is your piece on the political economy of equals. Um, and... One of the things that you, or one of the ideas you discuss relatively early on in this piece 
is the the way in which Buchanan gathered inspiration for his constitutional project from the American founding. So from from that particular democratic experiment. Um, And you also point out that for many very good reasons, we don't always hold the moral positions of the American founders and particularly high esteem anymore, particularly with respect to the, the, uh, you know, kind of convenient exception in their logic that they made for the practice of slavery and for enabling the practice of, of slavery to continue. Um, so I don't know, can, can you just open up that door for us to how we can start thinking about whether or not the constitution can be a source of inspiration, the sense in which it's a useful source of inspiration, even if as liberals, we want to and must reject the attitude that, that those people took towards the you know, enslavement and dehumanization of, of other people. Yeah, well, you've put it really well as, as a question there. So, yes, and Buchanan really revered the founding fathers. And I think it's fair to say he saw, you know, lots of America's problems or contemporary problems as to be connected to the, the decline of that reference. Um, I think that's definitely one of his positions that I think is a bit problematic, let's say, and for the reasons you, you allude to. So, you know, I think, depending on how we define the founding fathers, almost all of them owned slaves, and most of them justified owning slaves or, or spoke of the morality of slavery, but weren't willing to forgo their slaves because they feared the, the economic consequences for them personally. And that's clearly, you know, a, a position we should reject and we should be, I think, very critical of. Um, I think the reason why Buchanan revered the founding fathers was he felt they'd done something no one else had ever tried to do before. And that was simply to impose limits on themselves as the government. And I think he thought the idea that a group of people would essentially create a constitution and its sole purpose was to limit their power and other people's power. I think he thought that was a unique moment in history. And the fact that that you know, had worked tolerably well, I think, in his view, again, for him, that was the, the great American achievement. And I think he saw the hope, you know, the hope for liberalism, hope for the future, in the same principle being applied and implemented in other places, you know, in, in other times. Yeah, I, I think that yeah, one phrase that you used just now that really stood out to me is Buchanan being impressed by the fact that they put limits on themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a you know a plausible argument to me because we see him using that kind of logic in other spheres, even beyond the national constitutional, when he talks about his his theory of clubs, he's demonstrating um, at some level of interest in what people could accomplish if they put limits on themselves in that small group arena. Um, He has other pieces like Natural and Artifactual Man, where he talks about a private constitution and appreciates the, the use that can come from from people putting limits on themselves. Um, And so if this idea of self-rule, putting putting limits that apply not just to those who we would traditionally call ruled, but also putting those limits on the rulers themselves, in your view, is that the defining feature of Buchanan's constitutional political economy? Um, Is there more we need to add to that picture? It's definitely the core, I think. So as I would see it, so, I mean, Buchanan wrote about the the idea of a constitutional mentality. And I think that's the idea that, that, that the founders embodied for Buchanan. And I think that, so most people don't understand the constitution as, as simply what we've already talked about in a way. So the idea you simply limit what government can do as a way of protecting oneself and other people from yeah, exploitation and oppression by the government. But then there's this, there's a further component. And I think that's the idea of the idea that the rules of the game change the outcomes. So, you know, it's, there's, if you use the phrase, I think, um, same players, different rules. So as we modify the rules of the game, the constitutional rules, the outcomes change, 
we don't have to change people, we can just change the rules. And I think it's, it's so it's the, the second component after limited government is the appreciation of that principle. And then the third component follows from that is the appreciation that, that you can change the rules and you can change them to produce better outcomes. So I think for, for Buchanan, the founders understood all these three things. So the, limit, the ports of limiting government, there's the principle of same players, different rules, and then the idea you change the rules and change the outcomes. I think, <laughs> I'm going to go out on the limb here, but I think that's the essence of Buchanan's constitutional project, if you like, is, is those principles. And that's the constitutional mentality, if you like, is, is that, 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 that project, that program. What is your position on whether that American experiment was successful? I know there's been a lot of debate in political theory and political science over how, I, I guess I guess it be, could be two different debates, how um, plausible uh, the attempt was. So is that a reasonable way to go about getting a good government? And then also did these particular individuals effectively craft a constitutional structure that could limit government, limit oppression and, and limit um, capture by special interests. Um, oh, so what, yeah. what do you think about what do you think about those two, you know, is the project worthwhile and and how how far did they go in accomplishing that goal? Yeah. I'm sure the project is, is worthwhile. I mean, I'm sure, um, you know, the, the goal of a liberal polity, of a liberal constitution, I'm, sh I'm sure that's worthwhile. I'm sure that's, yeah, that's that's the best hope for, I mean, to come back to some of the things we mentioned earlier, the best hope for liberalism, the best hope for individuals, and, you know, the, the realisation of their goals. I think it's really hard for me to, to make a judgment about whether that succeeded. I'm conscious, you know, from, from, from Europe, from Britain, if you like, things may look different from here. Um, I think... It's very clear it's worked tolerably well. I think that's a judgment one can make relatively easily. If you look at America's prosperity, its place in the world, I think those have all, you know, they're all impressive achievements of the last, you know, uh, few couple of centuries. And if Buchanan's right about the rules of the game determine the outcomes, that's really down to the constitutional legacy. Um, I think Buchanan felt, as you probably know, that circa the sort of second half of the 20th century, America had really lost its way. And yes, special interest groups had really captured the process. And it was starting to look like, a, you know, like many of the democracies that were not so constrained. Again, I, I think Buchanan's probably right about that. But I may differ from him in that I think that it's actually very hard to stop special interest groups. And the, probably the best you can hope for is some sort of limit, limit to, to those things. But I think I think the evidence shows that, if you like, what we might call laissez-faire, so very limited government, is actually quite unstable because the, the, the gains from rent-seeking are so, are so large. And I think also sort of totalitarianism or, you know, very expansive government is also unstable. Those haven't lasted either. So I suspect you, you're, you're going to end up with stable government somewhere in the middle, so some sort of limited, relatively limited democracy. And America's achieved that and probably on the right side of the, the balance, if you like, of what's possible there. A few minutes ago, you used the phrase constitutional mentality. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the constitutional mentality or a constitutional mentality? Yeah, so I think it's this appreciation, I suppose, of, of the importance of the constitution. So what we kind of wrote in a book with, with uh, Jeffrey Brennan as the, the reason of rules. So why, why we have rules and why they matter. Um, and I think so firstly, just very importantly, we need to limit government to protect people. So government is a special organisation in society, of course. It has the power of, sort of legal coercion. And that's a dangerous thing in any society. So we need, we need, to, we need to limit government, control government. Uh, we might say we need to put democracy in change. We might argue that. Um, so secondly, then, it's the idea of, of rules and outcomes, as I mentioned. So that the, the rules of the game determine the outcomes produced. So as I said, this phrase that um, same players, different rules, produces different outcomes. And that, that's so important for Buchanan. And then I think the, the third part of the constitutional mentality is then the idea that you can change the rules and thereby change the outcomes. And that comes back to the idea that the founding fathers sought to limit government. So they saw in American society, you know, circa the 18th century, that they could change the rules and that would change America's future. And again, that, that's the constitutional mentality, sort of seeing that you can change the rules 
that would change the outcomes. And that can lead to yeah, a, a better future for, for all the people in that society. One of the points you make in your article is that for Buchanan, this constitutional mentality begins with a recognition of our, our moral equality. Maybe this is an obvious question. Um, I don't think I'm the only economist, though, who probably needs some help with my definition of morality. So maybe you can define what moral equality means for us. Um, and just and why that's such an important starting point or such an important part of the starting point. Yeah, well, I think it's quite a simple principle. Um, I think moral equality simply means that each person counts for one. So if you like in any sort of social calculation, let's say if that's not the wrong phrase, in any sort of assessment of, of outcomes, each person simply counts the same and each person counts for one. And this is usually sort of located and be kind of located this way usually located in Immanuel Kant's principle, one of his categorical imperatives, that one shouldn't use people as, as means to an end. So people, hence, are ends in themselves. And I think that's, that's the basic principle of moral equality. Clearly that there are also differences between people and ways in which people are unequal, but that doesn't change the basic moral equality. So the fact that people have different capabilities, like different physical attributes, different intellectual attributes and so on, that doesn't change the basic fact of, of moral equality. Mm. Yeah. Um, you use the phrase also uh, consensual politics. Uh, I really like I really like that usage of that term. You know, Buchanan and Tullock's book where they uh, introduce their theory about unanimous consent in politics is, of course, called the calculus of consent. Mm. Um, so what does it mean to have consent baked into our political institutions? Um, what is the gold standard? What should we, we be looking for to know whether or not our political institutions are based on consent? Yeah, curiously, this is a question I think is very sort of difficult or dangerous. I, I'm, it's a question I'm, I'm often wary of, though. I, I, I do bandy the term around a bit in my work. Um, but the, and the reason being that I think that political um, policies that, that use or claim broad consent are often not very democratic. So I think we, we could think of Putin's Russia at the moment. I think that Putin is claiming very large, you know, very significant consent for his actions in Ukraine. And I think we should be wary of, of governments that claim to have the, cons you know, the complete consent of, of their publics. I think, you know, 100% approval ratings are probably really a warning side of something going on. But I think, therefore, where Buchanan and Tuck in, in the calculus talk about consent, I think is a more basic principle, which is that one shouldn't impose costs on other people. So the idea of external costs or externalities. And I think consensual politics in, in this model is about a polity where people don't have costs imposed on them in this, in this way. So where people don't make you pay for things that you don't want or, or don't consume. I think that's that's the principle of, of if you like, consent that I think is relevant here. It, curiously, I think it comes back also to the idea from Nozick that I mentioned earlier in the, our discussion. And that's the idea that when, when we're thinking about individuals, you can't harm some people to benefit other people. All that happens then is one group get harmed or one individual, individual gets harmed and other people benefit. And again, I think it's the same principle here. That's the idea of consent, I think, that, that's relevant in, in Buchanan's work, just about not imposing cost on other people in this, in this quite crude sense. Yeah, it's almost like in political conversation, we've allowed the word consent to become too abstract and twisted ourselves around in circles a little bit. You know, we have a very, well, in different arenas, there's a lot of debate over whether the concept of consent is as clearly defined and well understood between parties as it should be. I, I think that's one of the really this this might seem like a total out of left field comment based on where we've been so far, but I think that's one of the positive things that's come out of the Me Too movement in the past uh, ten years. Just the, this more explicit conversation about what consent actually means to us in day to day life. But I think in many ways, our day-to-day our -day understanding of what it means to consent to something 
we very, very rarely enter into arrangements where we would think that consenting today means I've somehow given my unlimited consent for anything you might want to do for the next four years or in Putin's case, how many years, how many years now? Way more, way more than four. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, 20 years at least, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I'm curious to get your reaction to this, but my view is that the way consent is used in constitutional political economy is trying to bring our political institutions more into day-to-day reality to recognize that they are more in our day-to-day control than we can imagine. And therefore, I think, you know, the same kind of standards for consent that we would want to bring into our personal relationships, that we would want to bring into our medical relationships, our financial transactions, that, you know, those are actually a lot closer to the types of consent that it would be mutually beneficial to see in politics rather than these abstract versions of, oh, I have consent because at one point in the past, people said they liked me more than two other people that were options. I think, it's, I think that's right. So I, there's, there's undoubtedly complications. So compared to some of so there's something different about politics, I think. And one of the, the differences, so Buchanan's major work was called the limits of liberty. I think it could have been called the limits of consent in that I think that Buchanan thought that there were limits to how free we could be and limits to how much we can consent. And the obvious example is that we're born into a political system. So in a sense, you know, I guess you were born into America, I was born in in Britain, and I didn't consent in a sense to be a British citizen, simply happened by accident of birth. So I think that, that that limits, in a sense, does, does every new generation have to consent to all the rules of the game? I think Buchanan thought that that was, that was not possible or, or practicable or probably desirable. So, but then the question is, how do you move forward from that? How do you draw a line under those limits to consent and try and get a polity that respects individuals? And I think, again, that, that for Buchanan comes down to the constitutional mentality. It's about agreeing limits on what government can do. So, you know, the minimum amount of things could happen to people without their consent. But I I don't think we kind of thought we could have, we could consent to the whole, the whole thing, if you like, every person, because simply the fact that we're born into a, born into a, you know, a political system that, that, that removes that possibility, I think, in a very, in a sort of crude sense. So, and this, again, I think is one of the, one of the important points, I think, about public choice, it's often overlooked is that it is seen politics and markets, let's say, as fundamentally different. So I think in, in the economy, in one sense, when you make purchasing decisions, you consent to everything you buy in, in some sense. But I think in politics, there are the limits to liberty or consent that, that may not be quite the same in economics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in Buchanan's framework, he talks about unanimity as this kind of ideal concept where we could be certain that the rules of the game we were choosing were to the benefit of everybody involved if we had 100% unanimous consent. So you pointed out a couple of the reasons why that's not practicable in reality. One, we, you know, we don't wipe our society away and completely start over with every generation. Um, you know, he also emphasizes the, the holdout problem, just how difficult it is to come to 100 percent agreement on anything, probably in a group of 20, let alone a group of 350 million, you know, in the United States case. Yeah. So. One of the solutions he offers to this is to use a type of theorizing or like mental experiment where you are offering your best analytical case for why people would consent if we could be kind of behind a veil of ignorance, if we weren't aware what position we would hold, what property we would have. So he says, we we think about Would it be to the benefit of these kind of abstract versions of ourselves if we all came to agreement over a particular constitutional rule? Um, 
first, did I describe that fully enough or, or would you want to add to that? And second, can I just, is that a, do, do you view that kind of approach as consistent with liberalism and consistent with the rest of his approach in general in that, you know, originally we're told only individuals act, only individuals can make choices. And now we're kind of being given some license to make choices for other people, even if only in a, a mental theoretical way. Uh, so, so what's your reaction to that set of ideas? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's very difficult to describe. I mean, they, these are the, the most difficult issues that Buchanan's work raises. So in a sense, we, we begin with a statement of methodological and ethical individualism, as you say, that seems really robust and that it seems very attractive. And then you work with it a little bit and suddenly you're into these quite difficult, complicated issues. Um, I also think this, this is maybe one of the principal areas where I think there is shift in Buchanan's position across his work. So. I think he's, you know, he was incredibly consistent as a thinker, and some ideas are there from you know the 1950s right through to the end of his end of his career. But this is where I think he changed. So I think in the calculus of consent, you have the sort of project you describe where you have people behind. I think for Buchanan, it's a veil of uncertainty, isn't it? But but it's very much like the Rawls' it's veil of ignorance. And Buchanan there and Tullock are thinking about the ways that people may may consent and what they will consent to. And they claim, as you know, that, that they, for them, it comes down to a trade-off between decision-making costs and external costs. So how can we get things done, if you like, in politics while not imposing too many costs on other people? And they're looking for a sweet spot between those two sorts of costs. And they, they, they theorize ways in which we might find such a sweet spot. I think then in, in later work, Buchanan's much more concerned with, <laughs> with the inability to do that, in fact, with how... That, that project is not, not really going to work in the real world and how we sort of come to terms with that. Um, there is then a precursor of that later work, I think, in his paper in 1959 in the Journal of Law and Economics that I think you alluded to, where he argues that, you know, what he describes as the unreasonable, the unreasonable man. So somebody who opposes a policy, that, a policy that won't make himself or herself worse off, they can be ignored you can just impose, well, not impose costs because there are no costs, but even if they express disapproval to a policy, if they personally are not made worse off, you can ignore them. And I think that's really significant for all that follows. So somebody expressing opposition to a policy for Buchanan, I think it doesn't matter as long as they personally are not made worse off. You could argue that having something done you don't like, you know, the fact you view something being built, say, might, might make you worse off. But I think for Buchanan, that's, that's not good enough reason. So I think very early on from, from the 1950s, there is a wavering on unanimity as a principle in his work. Um, and I think then that develops into the idea of compensation. So it, it does come down to a compensation principle too, I think, from the calculus onwards. But I think this is not theoretical Cowdell Hicks imagined compensation, which economists will be familiar with, where if you can imagine people being compensated, that, that, that shows they consent in some theoretical way. For Buchanan, compensation is, is actually about going out into the field or into, into the world and negotiating with people and finding the terms on which they'll agree to new arrangements. So if you like, it's, it's, a, it's a project about local politics or politics on the ground, about how you make deals with people to, to get better rules and so on and hopefully get better politics. Yeah, of course, that, that compensation principle kind of drives us straight into another one of the really thorny issues with Buchanan's framework. Um, there's, there's so many, and I don't say that to be critical. I think that's a, a natural uh, result of the fact that it is such a rich theoretical framework. And also he's trying to offer a theory that explains collective action in its entirety in a very comprehensive way, you know, not even limited to formal politics. So, I mean, when he's dealing with so much, a, lo a lot of, a lot of difficult issues and a lot of tensions are going to emerge. Um, but so 
when we are looking at social change or changes in rules as negotiations and the people who are currently benefiting from the status quo are probably not going to want to see changes in the rules, at least not any changes that the rest of society would agree with them on. Um, So one of the problems you get into is that if you negotiate some kind of change from the status quo in that environment, it's the people who are currently disadvantaged to stand to benefit by the change in rules. And therefore, you can at least imagine situations where it's the people who are disadvantaged who then need to be compensating the people who are currently disadvantaging them. Um, And so, I mean, that gets very problematic very quickly. Uh, You know, when you think, especially when you think about people who have been victims of political oppression, they're now supposed to buy off political elites in order to gain their, perhaps even to gain their basic moral equality. Um, How, you know, how does, does Buchanan have good responses to this? Um, or, or responses at all, even if they're not good ones? <laughs> well, he, he definitely had responses. I think, I mean, you, you are clearly right. This is perhaps the most difficult issue I think Buchanan's work raises. And it's, yeah, what's, what's been termed the status of the, of the status quo. So, yeah, in Buchanan's framework, we're going to enter an era of consensual politics, if you like. And that means that moving forward, every change has to have the consent of all parties directly affected, let's put it that way which is some sort of, yeah, some proxy for unanimity. And as you, as you say, it's like a game of musical chairs, I suppose. The music stops, and whoever's sat in the chairs at that point, they get to sit in the chairs unless they can be, you know, paid off or new chairs can be created, if you like. Um, and that this does, yeah, raise some very difficult moral and practical questions. I mean, we've mentioned earlier the issue of slavery in, you know, American history. And I think it's undoubtedly true that in Buchanan's theory, you know, slavery could only be abolished with the consent of the slave owners, that they would have to be brought off in some way in order to, to, to free the slaves. And that's clearly a very, you know, very morally difficult issue. Um, I think for Buchanan, that's that's not to do with any sort of sympathy for slave owners. I think I think quite the reverse. I think, you know, he had no sympathy, no sympathy at all for slave owners. But it's simply that we're going to enter an area, an era of, different politics. So politics is no longer going to be, if you like, a war of all against all. We're going to have politics that is, if you like, fair. And that can only happen if everybody agrees to enter this new era. And that does mean, yeah, we're potentially going to have to buy off slave owners so we can compensate them. So if we're clear, I think, that the compensation is sufficient, we can, if you like, enforce the compensation, so to speak. I think we could, if, if we're clear that the, the people are not being made worse off, I think that that's okay. I think that will be the case. So I think, I mean, there's two further points that may be said. One is, is that I think it, this is informed, I think, and this is actually David Levy and Sandra Pert have made this point. It's informed by a view that any society that contains slavery has lots of beneficiaries. So it's not just the slave owners, but also the people who purchase goods made with slave labor. They're benefiting from this process. So therefore, if we're going to take, if you like, taxation, going to tax those people to fund emancipation, then in one sense, that's a transfer from a large group of beneficiaries of injustice to you know, a subgroup of that, of, that, of that group. So one might say that justifies this. The second thing is if you look at the civil wars in the case of America, you know, incredibly costly enterprise in terms of human life, you know, material costs of the civil war, and the compensation Britain paid, for example, to free British, British slaves was much was smaller than the cost of the Civil War. So you can argue the trade-off is, you know, on the positive side of the balance sheet. But still, it's clearly a really difficult moral case. And yeah, why those people should be compensated, you know, is quite hard to, to bring forward a very good argument, I suspect, I think, on moral terms. But Buchanan wanted to bring forward such an argument. He believed if we're going to have, you know, genuine politics without external costs, that can only come about consensually, you know, we, we can't impose costs on people to, to create a society without costs. 
kind of in formulating that response, do you think Buchanan took seriously enough a commitment to justice and the fact that the trust that could generate might be a really critical precondition for us to even have that constitutional mentality, you know, especially when we're looking at examples. I mean, there are, there are smaller, less emotionally triggering examples of this as well. Like for example, the, the taxi medallions in New York city, you have the, you know, win that. I don't, I'm not sure what the current status of medallions is in the past few years with the challenges from Uber and all of that, but at least for a long time, extraordinarily expensive people invested millions. Um, and so any reform in the taxi cab medallion system that would actually increase the supply of taxis in the New York city, in the New York city area, you have these taxi owners that would need to be compensated and bought off by people who want to get into the business who aren't making money yet. So I think we, like we see these kind of examples at all scales of activity. But kind of in these ones, in in like the example of the, you know, the institution of, of slavery in the American South in, in the 19th century, it's such a deep injustice. And I think so. I think a lot of people very reasonably have a reaction to this kind of proposal of needing to like negotiate with the, the slaveholders about that that maybe even if you argue that we're now starting off on a consensual footing, you'd maybe have to say also that we're starting off on an unjust footing because the advantaged people had all these tools available to them in the prior, you know, not so, not so voluntary setup. And now you're saying, so now, but now when we renegotiate that, you're not allowed to use those tools against us. You know that you're you're not allowed to use the same bargaining chips. So, so I I don't know. Do, do you think that he maybe? He, I mean, he never. To be clear, you know, Buchanan doesn't do a lot of explicitly empirical work. So this is more us taking his theory and trying to apply it to this particular historical example, yeah. um, rather than something he actually wrote about. But do you think if we're trying to do that application, in that application, should we, and by we, I mean people who use Buchanan's work, people who are committed to liberalism, should we be more seriously incorporating justice into that conversation as an important concept along with the constitutional mentality and along with consensual politics. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, you raised so many questions right away. So I mean, the, the, the parallel with the tax medallions, maybe to begin there with the easy, <laughs> the easy question, if you like. Yeah. That, that's clearly present. And yeah, there, there's definitely, again, to use what may be slightly, you know, inappropriate language, but there's, there's definitely a transitional gains trap in the case of slavery too. So if we believe that a free economy is going to be more prosperous than a, you know, an unfree economy in the long run, Nevertheless, there are going to be beneficiaries of the unfree economy who are going to lose in the short term, who may stop that transition and so on. So there's definitely a parallel that's important. I think you're undoubtedly correct that, yeah, Buchanan doesn't think enough about justice in the case of the people who have been exploited and oppressed in the status quo and then just prior to the status quo and how, the, how those people are going to accept the, the new move, if you like. The only thing is that their consent is required too, it must be said. So we have to have a deal, if you like, that they will consent to also. But as you say, Buchanan's work was almost entirely abstract. So I happen to know that he just made one comment about slavery that existed in America. And that was that it, it had been uh, immoral. So he was, again, he was quite clear that slavery was, you know, had been immoral. But he also wrote that, you know, in thinking about constitutional rules, people are going to pick utility over fairness. And I think that means that justice is secondary to, to, to if you like, getting things done, if you like, getting moving to a new system. So I think Buchanan thought that every, it was in everybody's interests not to think too much about the justice of the past, but to think about the utility of the future and how we get there. And again, I, I've thought a lot about these questions and 
you know, I'm not sure I've come up with a really satisfactory answer. But I think there's this, I think many people come in at these issues reading what Buchanan said, yeah, find it hard to, to come to terms with it. And it's one reason why I think Buchanan might not be as, you know, as, as wide, widely accepted as he, as he could be for these sorts of questions. The, the final thing I might say, if you like, or he might say in his defence, is that curiously, I think it all comes down to Buchanan a sort of manifesto for sort of pacifism or non-violence is that if we're going to have a world without coercion, without violence, how do we get there? And I think the answer can't be by coercion, even if the people we want to coerce are evil wrongdoers. I think we have to find a way to get them to consent as well. So we move to this new future. And that that's how you, you, you move from if you like this very pessimistic, realistic public choice where we look at interest groups and the way that politics works in practice to this you know, idealism about this future of unanimous people living in a world without external costs imposed on one another. And this, if you like, is a tension maybe in Buchanan's work that, yeah, there's pessimism and there's optimism, there's realism and idealism. And hopefully this is, as you say, again, this is where the action is. This is why it's actually quite good to read. But there's, there's definitely a project here to try and work all this out and try and move it forward, I think. Yeah. I think one of the challenges with that historical case is that slavery is so universally recognized today as morally abhorrent that it's easy to be able to imagine making a convincing case that anybody would who would enslave is clearly violating some sort of basic moral contract. But this negotiation was taking place during a time yeah. when there was a large mass of people who at least found it acceptable and practical, even if they didn't particularly like it. So I, I don't know if you can think of anything in Buchanan that directly addresses, or, or maybe you even already said it, but it, just the practicality of wanting to the greatest extent possible to avoid having to use violence in carrying out these negotiations? That is, that is the question, I think, for Buchanan. He doesn't use this, this sort of language, but it seems to follow, which is that if we believe society should be organised along, you know, non-violent lines, that, that then how do we deal with existing injustices? I don't know if this, there's another example we could briefly mention. I don't know if this will be, how well it will resonate, but you could think of the Northern Ireland peace process in. Um, well, it's related to, to the Britain Island, of course. And there you had also 20 years of terrorist atrocities and so forth that was brought to an end by a peace settlement in which essentially the people committed those atrocities were, were absolved, literally free from prison. Um, people who had not yet been prosecuted were, were no longer prosecuted and so on. And there was a lot of clearly angst around that process, rightly so. But it has led to, you know, an end, an end to violence of the kind that was that we had for 20 years or so in Northern Ireland. So, you know, there was clearly great injustices committed, probably on both sides. But we have had a negotiation that's brought about a peaceful settlement. Again, I, I think, as you say, I can, I can see, as you describe it, why it's hard to, to draw the parallel. But for Buchanan, the same principle would apply, I think. So slavery is a great, a great wrongdoing, a great evil injustice. But to bring it to an end, I think, requires a peaceful settlement. I, I think, again, I, I think that will be Buchanan's position. Let me ask you just one more question on this and then, uh, then we'll wrap up because we're running short on time. Um, but if, so if someone has a commitment to, to liberalism, to this uh, kind of doctrine of, moral equality and politics by consent and the liberal program in general. Is there an argument to be made that it that a better way to advance that position would be to try to convince people who are currently in power or who are currently in beneficiary are currently beneficiaries of the system, whether it's with respect to 
um, you know, immigration, pre preventing immigration out of a misguided notion of trying to, you know, maintain personal gains or, you know, whatever the issue might be. Do you think there's room, do you think there's space to convince people, hey, that offering better bargains, offering better de deals as a way to move forward what can kind of bring more people into a constitutional mentality. And so therefore there's a clear benefit to that that should be incorporated when, you know, I don't know, maybe this is, I, I think this is one of the things I struggle with is that it's very easy to bring a lot of idealism into the constitutional project. You know, public choice is politics without romance. Constitutional political economy clearly has some romance because we're talking about these big institutional changes, imagining rules changing. So I don't know, am I, am I on to something here? Or is this just far too abstract to be useful? This idea that maybe we could convince, even if we're stuck with the status quo, maybe we could convince the current beneficiaries that there's a value to them in a society where they don't hold their position quite as tightly. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, absolutely correct. And I, th I think that also is Buchanan's point and maybe it's something we should be, yeah, as you imply, we could usefully bring out. So I think one reason why Buchanan thought there might be a deal, say, contemporary America, so in, in The Limits of Liberty, he writes at the, the end of that book about some sort of new constitutional settlement between people, between the victims of injustice and, yeah, the beneficiaries of the status quo, was because if we don't do that, then their prosperity is under threat as well. So, you know, there's a the risk of what Buchanan termed constitutional anarchy. You know, politics becoming more conflictual, more of a war of all against all. So yes, I think it does require a, a move away from polarized politics, probably into a politics where people see that we've all got to live together. You know, we mentioned some of the values of liberalism, but pluralism, tolerance, these are also important liberal values. And to live together probably requires, yeah, negotiation, compromise. I think these are, yeah, these are also what we see in Buchanan's work. And I think the principle of unanimity is, is a principle of compromise, if you like. You know, if we're going to aim for unanimous consent for politics, then that must involve compromise. So yes, I think I think it does it does move in that direction. Yeah, because unanimity is not imagining that there's going to be some way for everybody to get everything they want. Yeah, yeah ex exactly. It's that's right. Coming up with that mutually agreeable set of compromises such that we can all be a little better off than we would be without it. Yes, that's right. Um, okay, so final question here for you, John. Um, what do you see as the greatest opportunity or opportunities moving forward to kind of take steps towards this society of freely relating moral equals? So, so if that's our if that's our vision that reconciles equality and liberalism and, and gives us potential for this politics as consent. How, how do you, do you see ways for us to move towards that from where we are today, from our current status quo? Well, I hope, yeah, I hope we can see ways. So yeah, thinking about those, those sort of questions where we are today, it's tempting to think, I suspect we're living in sort of dark times. I mean, we've had the COVID pandemic, we've had you know, the, the, the return of the Taliban in, in Afghanistan, we've had obviously conflicts in, in Ukraine, you know, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it's tempting to, to be pessimistic, but I, I think that places the onus on liberals to, to offer an alternative. And I think that liberalism can be a beacon for all those places, all those people. And that's the, that's the you know, that's the historical project, I think, of liberalism. I mean, I used to work at the Institute of Economic Affairs, and that was founded by F.A. Hayek, also, you know, a big figure of this program. And I think when Hayek founded the IA, he wrote about the idea of saving the books, that, you know, the, the task of liberals then in the 1940s was to save the great works of liberalism. And I think, you know, that, that goal has been achieved. So the, the question now is, how do we take forward and develop these great works? 
I think, you know, Buchanan's shown one direction that we can take them and, you know, really brought out important theories about constitutionalism, the reason of rules and so forth. And some of the issues we've discussed, those are the, the challenges of the future, aren't they? How do we bring about politics that doesn't impose costs on other people, politics that isn't you know, a rent-seeking project, isn't about external costs? And developing that sort of 21st century liberalism, I think that's a challenge for the future. That's a challenge for, for young people today, I think. Yeah, and nobody ever said that was going to be an easy project. It's going to involve some difficult conversations. So even if we haven't given too many answers, hopefully we've at least raised some important questions here. And you know, I, I really thank you for not just being here today, but for your contributions to wrestling with some of these really thorny issues. And just uh, thank you for being willing to, to have that dialogue. No, thank you. It's been great. I've, I've enjoyed it. So thank, thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason, as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.